President Nixon's departure for China. South Lawn, 17 February 1972. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Congress and members of the Cabinet, I want to express my very deep appreciation to all of you who have come here to send us off on this historic mission. And I particularly want to express appreciation to the bipartisan leadership of the House and Senate who are here. We, of course, are under no illusions that 20 years of hostility between the People's Republic of China and the United States of America are going to be swept away by one week of talks that we will have there. We must recognize that the government of the People's Republic of China and the government of the United States have had great differences. We will have differences in the future. But what we must do is to find a way to see that we can have differences without being enemies in war. If we can make progress toward that goal on this trip, the world will be a much safer world, and the chance particularly for all of those young children over there to grow up in a world of peace will be infinitely greater. I would simply say in conclusion that if there was a postscript that I hope might be written with regard to this trip, it would be the words on the plaque which was left on the moon by our first astronauts when they landed there. We came in peace for all mankind. Thank you and goodbye.
The president's mood, I'm glad to say, after having worked with him and for him for 21 years, is one of really great pride, and certainly all of us have great pride in him today, because he's, as I think he always is, in complete control of his well, his destiny, but more, I think, the countries and the world. His mood is uh, pensive. He has studied. He has worked hard. He has thought about this for, well, I know from early 1967, 68, maybe longer, that somehow we had to have a negotiation. We, we couldn't have this many million people alienated from the United States. I can only hope and pray and join the rest of the world in hoping it will be successful. And I am excited. I am proud. Lived through a lot of big moments with the Nixons. But I think this is truly one of the greatest. Thursday, February 17th, departure ceremonies and the takeoff of Andrews all went very well with no problems. The president seemed to be in great spirits on the chopper going over to Andrews as uh, he too felt the whole thing had gone well. So uh, things seemed to be off to an auspicious start. We saw a little bit of the uh, TV coverage after we got on the plane because they had the uh, sat on the table in the staff room. It was kind of an odd feeling because we they covered the actual takeoff of, of the Spirit of 76 and we were on the plane watching the TV covering the takeoff, which was sort of fascinating. I think what we have to do the, till the first day is to uh, is to feel it out as we uh, we're going we're going to, have to find out what the mood is. Uh, we have, want to find out whether whether uh, the mood might be on the basis of their statement they made a couple of days ago, or it might be they may have said that. No, they may have said something else. And I want to feel naturally there'll be in the. Plenary sessions. We'll have every. We'll have our every, all our interpreters there. But uh, I do not want to have a situation, say, where I'm in a in what is basically a very private meeting with him, where I'm bringing where there are extra people there. My experience has been that these times are really illustrative. They. Yeah. They let it run. Well, the difficulty is that that day we have a plenary session and we have a dinner, don't we? Yeah. Okay. To postpone the dinner. Yeah. I've never seen them pay any attention. But they always start on the second. I mean, there's right. never, they're never late. You start on the second and end on the hour. But, uh, but I think they, again, just judging by my October trip. They'll get it done in two hours in the plenary session because you'll make a statement, he'll make a statement, and there'll be some general agreement on how to proceed. This is most interesting with the Chinese. And your comments before about Mao and Joe and uh, Al Rose anti memoirs are most interesting. You know? Yeah, and read the first part too. Uh, it's talk about uh, really the more interesting part is his evaluation of the Gaul. It's, uh, it's rather fascinating. Except 
to make one reel of the very best of it, and then a series of, of, of just shots, sort of a montage of the of the leaders as they stood on the platform. So you go gling, 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 one after another. Then it'll, that'll be fascinating. Hello, Governor. How are you? Good. Oh, here's the governor. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's very. I'll do my own if you don't mind. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You, Governor, you get to do your own. Say, <laughs> we've done this before. Now we're good. We always have you here. Glad to have a day in Hawaii before moving on across the world. Uh, I'm going to work tomorrow, but I'm going to sit in the sun. Work. Get, get some of that tan you've got. <laughs> a little proud. Yeah. How are you? Thank you for all the flowers through the year. Aloha! You've been good for 20 years. Hey, man. <laughs> Roll, baby. Roll. You know, the uh, I think we got, we're going to have to walk a very fine line in this briefing today because it's the first briefing with this group that's that's going to China with us. And because of the many sensitivities with the People's Republic of China, I think I think we want to give them a general feel of, of uh, what the visit will be about, what the discussions will be about, but we can't in any way get into the agenda or get into uh, the schedule because it's not set. Now, I think we want to talk a little bit about the leadership meeting yesterday and the point that the President made that all Americans uh, have a stake in this visit, uh, that uh, it's the beginning of a process, a process of communications with a country that we haven't really been in touch with for 21 years and, and uh, how we want that process to continue and, and how the continuation of that process will be discussed in the meetings. And I think. I think that's the only tone we want to leave this morning, don't you? Yeah, it's going to be a rough session, Ron, because uh, they're just thirsting for news, and you know you have an all-star cast down there. So I don't envy you your job this morning. Well, when you put Buckley and Teddy White and Max Frankel and Phil Potter and John Chancellor and Walter Cronkite and all those people in one room, I guess they are going to be a little difficult today. But we'll deal with it. Saturday, February 19th in Hawaii. The president had me over at 10 this morning. We got into some domestic questions on the busing thing, the poverty bill, the dock strike. We went over the schedule for next week and uh, he discussed some of his tactic for handling the meetings and the techniques that he's going to use. He says Henry's urging him to do it Henry's way, which is to get into the long drawn out historical and philosophical discussions with Joe. 
which uh, the president is not inclined to do. Henry's also urging him to start in the plenary session with a reading a written statement, which uh, the president also is not inclined to do, and intends to follow his own uh, technique on this rather than Henry's advice. He feels that uh, he'll do much better that way, and I think he's absolutely right. This is not a time for a long speech, but I would not want this opportunity to pass without saying just a word with regard to the significance of this moment. Some of you may recall that it was two and a half years ago that right here in Guam, I announced a new direction for American foreign policy based on the principles of self-reliance, self-respect, equal dignity for all nations, large and small, throughout the world. And tomorrow, I will take off from Guam for Shanghai and Peking, the first president of the United States ever to visit China. Guam, I know it is said, is where the American day begins. <laughs> And I would hope that all of you here today would join me in this prayer that with this trip to China, a new day may begin for the whole world. Thank you very much.
at uh, about 2.30 or maybe a little bit before, apparently Joe and Lai appeared at the guest house unannounced, got a hold of Henry and said that uh, Chairman Mao would like to uh, see the president if he would come over. Henry rushed upstairs, uh, told the president, he slapped on his coat, and two of them went out, grabbed Bob Taylor on the way, and uh, took off for uh, Mao's residence, unbeknownst to anybody else. Taylor came into the Chapin's schedule planning meeting and said that this is what they were going to do. He was very concerned about it, uh, but that he was under orders to tell no one, and that they were not to tell they were going to make any public thing out of it until they got back. So Dwight came right down and told me. We debated how to handle the thing for a while, called Ziegler and had him come over, and I told him. Ron was holding a tangerine in his hand, took a bite of it, getting about half the tangerine in one bite, peeling it off. He was, to say the least, a little startled. We spent uh, a very long hour and a half trying to figure out what the uh, various contingencies were since we had no idea when they'd be back or what would happen in the meantime. Since we couldn't announce any of this, uh, we didn't exactly know how to handle it. We debated it back and forth as to what to do. Also speculated on all the uh, wild range of possibilities that you have when you're sitting in a the Chinese guest house with Red Army troops uh, guarding you outside, and you kind of wonder, is the president's taken off alone with no staff, no security, except one agent, no doctor, etc. But uh, the worries generally turned out to be uh, unfounded since the president returned shortly after four. Anyway, uh, the president called me up, told me he'd been over to see Mao. Obviously, he was very impressed with the whole thing, but didn't get into any details at that time. President Nixon's visit to our country at the invitation of the Chinese government provides the leaders of the two countries with an opportunity of meeting in person to seek the normalization of relations between the two countries and also to exchange views on questions of concern to the two sides. This is a positive move in conformity with the desire of the Chinese and American peoples and an event unprecedented in the history of the relations between China and the United States. The American people are a great people. The Chinese people are a great people. The peoples of our two countries have always been friendly to each other. But owing to reasons known to all, contacts between the two peoples were suspended for over 20 years. Now, through the common efforts of China and the United States, the gate to friendly contacts has finally been opened. In conclusion, I propose a toast to the health of President Nixon and Mrs. Nixon, to the health of our other American guests, to the health of all our friends and comrades present, and to the friendship between the Chinese and American peoples.
Hey, China in the past has been, and what China in the future can become. A people that could build a wall like this uh, certainly uh, have a great past to be proud of, and a people who have this kind of a past uh, must also have a great future. Uh, my hope is that in the future, perhaps as a result of uh, the beginning that we have made on this journey that many, many Americans, particularly the young Americans who like to travel so much, will have an opportunity to come here as I have come here today with Mrs. Nixon and the others in our party. That they will be able to see this wall. Uh, that they will think back as I think back to the history of this great people. Uh, and that they will have an opportunity as we have had an opportunity to know the Chinese people and know them better. Uh, and uh, I think one of the results of our trip, we hope, may be that uh, the walls that are erected, uh, whether they are physical walls like this or whether they are other walls of ideology or philosophy, uh, will not divide peoples in the world. Uh, that peoples, regardless of their differences in backgrounds and their philosophies, will have an opportunity to communicate with each, with each other, to know each other, uh, and to share with each other uh, those particular endeavors that will mean peaceful progress in the years ahead. So all in all, I would say finally, I, we've come a long way to be here today, 16,000 miles. And uh, many things that have occurred in this trip uh, have made me realize that uh, it was worth coming. But I would say as I look at the wall, it's worth coming 16,000 miles just to stand here and see the wall. You agree, Mr. Secretary? I certainly do, Mr. President. It really is a tremendous privilege that we've all had to be here today. Are we rolling? Is the mic clear of the shot? There. No, it's in. Okay, clear. We are now in the final hours of the President's momentous visit. This farewell banquet here in Shanghai. Da -da 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 -da. Keep it rolling. We are now in the final hours of the President's momentous visit. This is the farewell banquet in Shanghai, a few hours before the President ends his unprecedented pilgrimage to peace and flies back to Washington. The guests here, Americans and Chinese alike, and the rest of the people around the world will one day have reason to thank Richard Nixon for having the courage and the vision to fly to Peking to further his search for a generation of peace. Uh, 
you get a little rest today? I need to one hour. One hour. Me too. Okay. Bad luck. Bad luck. Feathers that peacock is especially great. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, don't <laughs> Because they want to make it better than a child. Oh, you don't need to be humble, not to take any more calls. <laughs> this is a key tool. Because on some of their characteristics, <laughs> of this, we picked it over by a child last night, so they couldn't. Um, do exactly what they did in Hanzhou. Uh, <laughs> the female would like to tell Mr. President the secret. That is, he told our Minister of uh, Deputy Minister of uh, uh, Public Security to get here uh, last night to tell them to not repeat the decorations in uh, Hanzhou last night and of a new decoration that they would tell. Let's see whether they are committing the dishes or not. Not too many, not too many. Less than that in Hanzhou. I don't think we'll start tonight. <laughs> 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 Mr. Prime Minister, Chairman Chong, and our Chinese and American friends. This magnificent banquet marks the end of our stay in the People's Republic of China. We have been here a week. This was the week that changed the world. As we look back over this week, we think of the boundless hospitality that has been extended to all of us by our Chinese friends. We have today seen the progress of modern China. We have seen the matchless wonders of ancient China. We have seen also the beauty of the countryside, the vibrancy of a great city, Shanghai. All this we enjoyed enormously. But most important was the fact that we had the opportunity to have talks with Chairman Mao, with Prime Minister Zhou Enlai, with the Foreign Minister and other people in the government. The joint communique which we have issued today summarizes the results of our talks. But what we have said in that communique is not nearly as important as what we will do in the years ahead to build a bridge across 16,000 miles and 22 years of hostility which have divided us in the past. And what we have said today is that we shall build that bridge with Chairman Mao, with the Prime Minister, and with others with whom we have met, our talks have been characterized by frankness, by honesty, by determination, and above all, by mutual respect. Our communique indicates, as it should, some areas of difference. It also indicates some areas of agreement. To mention only one that is particularly appropriate here in Shanghai is the fact that this great city over the past has on many occasions been the victim of foreign aggression and foreign occupation. And we join the Chinese people, we the American people, 
in our dedication to this principle that never again shall foreign domination, foreign occupation be visited upon this city or any part of China or any independent country in this world. Mr. Prime Minister, our two peoples tonight hold the future of the world in our hands. And as we think of that future, we are dedicated to the principle that we can build a new world, a world of peace, a world of justice, a world of independence for all nations. And if we succeed in working together where we can find common ground, if we can find the common ground on which we can both stand, where we can build the bridge between us and build the new world, generations in the years ahead will look back and thank us for this meeting that we have held in this past week. And let the great Chinese people and the great American people be worthy of the hopes and ideals of the world for peace and justice and progress for all. It's already has been stated in the communique, hasn't it? I don't have anything more to add to that communique. <laughs> The premier can get some rest now. Now it's only can get some rest now.